Chapter 36 The Secrets of Dawn A low, rolling sound rumbled into Mole's sleep. Gone were the drums, gone were the rattles and the chants. This noise was different and she'd recognise it awake or asleep. Her eyes flickered open a fraction. Two wide yellow-green orbs hovered in front of her face. They were lined with black circles and dashed with vertical stripes. She blinked. The rolling noise again. Bro. Mole blinked a second time, then opened her eyes. Griff, she smiled, holding him into her arms and hugging him tight. She looked around her at the red velvet curtains drawn back from the bed, at the morning sunshine streaming through her shutters at the polished pine walls, at the kingfisher feathers and giant fir cones scattered on her wardrobe. Someone had restored it all, and for the first time in weeks, Mole felt a surge of happiness. She buried her head in Griff's fur and laughed. He purred contentedly. We did it, Griff, she whispered. We found the first amulet, and we set my pa's soul free. She tickled the wildcat's ear. And somewhere out there is my ma, she said. Her heart beat excitedly at the thought. Then she sat upright in her bed and gasped. Oh, all that, said Oak, who was sitting on a chair before a collection of strain, strange objects strewn across the end of Mole's bed. Lucky charms from the camp to make sure you woke up in good health. The stones with holes in, them are from Hard Times Bob. He thinks they'll be lucky. He pointed to the larger stone, one that would have taken hours to haul inside the wagon. The daft old man thought he could squeeze his body through this one, but he got stuck around his ribcage and he's had the hiccups ever since. Maul giggled. Oak picked up a jam jar full of minnows. Siddy's lucky charm. Except no one in the camp agrees it's a lucky charm. He wanted to chuck it in your face to bring you round, but Patty warned him that was one step too far. Oak held up a cluster of red berries. Holly berries, from Mooshi. I'm afraid she hoped if a fertility charm was the first thing you saw on coming round, you might start acting more like a lady in the future. Mole squeezed out the air from inside her cheeks. <coughs> I made an unladylike squelch. And that, she asked, pointing to a black plaited bracelet which looked as if it had been made from animal hair. That's from Alfie, Oak replied. Said he didn't believe in lucky charms, so he made you a bracelet from Raven's tail. He said if Raven carried him away safe from the deep wood, maybe he could help bring you back too. Mole didn't need to ask what Oak had given her. Her wagon was as good as new, and it was clear he hadn't left her side since the deep wood. And that kind of loyalty was more important than any present or charm. How long have I been sleeping? Mull asked. Four days. The dream snatch. It almost sucked the life right out of you. I've never slept that good or and long. She paused, her eyes widening. Does that mean it's stopped coming for me? The dream snatch won't twist my dreams to nightmares any more. Oak smiled. You and Griff broke the dream snatch. You shattered it to pieces once and for all when you lifted the amulet up. Moll leant into Griff. I don't understand, though. What happened back in school's clearing, she asked. Why did the amulet release all its power then? Why not when the shadow mask came to our camp? Oak's eyes sparkled. I'm not sure, but the old magic first stirred when time dawned. So magic's at its strongest when light changes. When daylight drops to dusk or night drifts into dawn. Oh, you're just saying words that begin with D. Oak shuffled onto the bed and ruffled Moll's hair. I'm not lying, Moll. Magic's at its strongest when light changes. So I think when dawn came to school's clearing, the amulet was at its most powerful. But didn't the shadow masks have curses and chants to break the amulet's power? There's nothing stronger than the powers locked inside the amulets of truth. Your pa said the first amulet stood for bravery. So when you raced to help Griff and gave it even more power, the shadow masks may have brewed curses dark enough to splinter souls, but 
They were broken in the face of your courage, Oak smiled. The amulets are part of a deeper magic still, and so long as we find them all, the shadow masks can't touch our souls. The last four shadow masks will come for me though, won't they? Mole said quietly. They haven't gone for good. Oak shook his head. I don't think so. Not gone. Weakened, maybe. Forced back for a while. But they'll come again, he paused. Which is why, in a few days, we'll be leaving the ancient wood. Mole shook her head. Leaving? But it's no longer safe, Mole. Dark Bike knows where you and Griff are. But, but where will we go? This is, this has always been home. Oak squeezed Mole's arm. We'll live as outlaws down by the sea. Mole's eyes grew big. By that big puddle of water leading out to the edge of the world. She shivered, then looked round her wagon. We'd have to leave all this, she paused. And what if Griff doesn't like the sea? Oak smiled. I've been over the heath and down to a cove by the seashore, Mull, while you've been resting. He paused. And if you thought living in a wagon was good, wait until you see the cave I've found. A ripple of excitement flickered inside Mull. She nodded to Griff. We might quite like caves, actually. You're the guardian of the oracle bones now, Mull, Oak said. Soon, you must throw the bones and then we'll follow the bone reading to find the second amulet. With it, we'll destroy the soul splinter. Mole's body tingled, but Skull and Hemlock, they said their souls are locked inside the soul splinter, and they're never going to die. How can we kill someone who can't die? Oak shook his head. We just have to hope that if the first amulet destroyed Skull and Hemlock like that, the last two will have the power to destroy the soul splinter. Then the Shadow Mask's soul will die, and the Bone Murmur, and all it stands for, will be restored for good. Mole groaned. <sighs> That's heavy, that talk. I was better with the jar of minnows, maybe even Mooshy's hollyberries. Oak wrapped her up in a big hug. Come on, come and see everyone. They've missed you. Siddy said that even Porridge, the second's taken your absence hard. Once Oak had left, Mole bounced out of bed, filled with an energy she'd almost forgotten she'd ever had. She pushed Alfie's bracelet over her wrist and threw on a dress. And then she remembered. The clearing, the sacred oaks, the blazing flames. She edged out of her wagon with Griff. Her mouth fell open. But, but... Oak smiled. Turns out that amulet of yours had a healing power. Same as the water in the well. Cinderella Bull said the sacred oaks twisted up stronger, bigger and greener than ever before when we were fighting Skull and Hemlock in the deep wood. We think it was your pa's way of saying thank you. Mull's gaze dropped to the centre of the clearing, where a haphazard jumble of spotted neckerchiefs, ruffled shirts, brightly coloured waistcoats and glittering rings were assembled. Every member of Oak's camp was there with Siddy and Alfie in the middle, waving an enormous banner which only included one word spelt correctly. Welcome back, Moll. They'd drawn a picture of Moll and Griff next to the writing, but it was hard to tell which one was Griff and which one was Moll. Both were a mass of cross-looking squiggles with lots of fur and hair. Hard Times Bob struck upon his accordion, and in moments everyone was cheering and shouting, and even Cinderella Bull was shaking her shawl in an excited dance. Mole jumped off her wagon steps, and for a reason that was too difficult to explain, she shuffled over to Florence and hugged her tight. Florence smiled, and Mole knew that somewhere her pa would be watching. Mooshy bustled over, sobbing loudly and embracing Mole with a favourite towel. Then Wisdom hoisted Mole up onto his shoulders. In a single leap, Griff sprang up to Mole's wagon roof to watch while Siddy clambered onto Alfie's back and they charged about the clearing trying to wrestle Mole down. The cheering grew louder, the beats faster and the dancing and wrestling wilder. 
Mind you don't make those wrestling towers any higher, Mol, Mushi shouted. The skies are full of strange birds, including great eagles that'll snatch you up and eat you whole. Mole looked over at Griff and laughed. Snatch me? Not likely. She glanced back at the fire and suddenly noticed what Mushi and Patty were preparing. Dochi, backy balls, she screamed, swerving wisdom to the left. Beside the fire, Mushi and Patty had laid up two rows of stools, logs and fallen branches, and down the middle, on tree stumps and upturned boxes, were bowls of one of Mole's favourite foods. Small bowls of crisp bacon wrapped in roasted dock leaves sprinkled with vinegar. Mm. Before long, the entire camp was scoffing down dolce backy balls and raising toasts of forest fruits tea in the summer sun. Mole sat with Siddy and Alfie while Griff nestled beneath one of the boxes they ate off, gulping down the food that Mole tossed to the ground for him. Mole turned to Alfie. So you're a member of Oak's camp now, and you'll learn our ways and superstitions soon enough. Like you must never wash a blanket in May because you'll be washing away your family, Siddy added excitedly. Alfie shrugged. I haven't got a family. Siddy tried again. If you're pregnant, you mustn't wear shoes because it's like putting your baby in a coffin before it's even born. Alfie raised his eyebrow. Not likely to have a baby either, Sid. Mole threw her hands up. Oh, we'll go through the superstitions another time. What's more important than all this is the tribe. That's something you want to get into if you're in Oak's camp. Alfie took a swig of his tea. Who's in the tribe then? Mole and Siddy drew themselves up very tall. Us two? We're the tribe, Mole paused. And I may ask Florence in a few days if she promises not to make me go hawking with her. From Mole's feet there came a growl. Oh, uh, and Griff, he's in the tribe too. What does this tribe do? Alfie asked. Siddy lowered his voice. Break rules, mainly. Avoid chores. Tells lies on Tuesdays and Thursdays, Mull said. And does brave things like rescuing trapped otters and mending, mending owl's wings. Alfie considered. Mull leant forward so that only he could hear. I'll do it, Alfie, because you've got to remember that I'm not buying into school stories about your past. And I know you don't believe them either. I reckon there's stuff you're still not telling us. Like why you thought the amulets, amulets could help. Alfie leant back on his stool and then, to Mole's surprise, he winked. So there were secrets he was holding back. Alfie held Mole's gaze. I mean, Siddy jumped up, sending Porridge the second flying into a nearby cup. I've got to tell you, Alfie, there are a number of tests you have to do before you're allowed in. Alfie raised his eyebrow. Like what? Mole lowered the last of her dolce backy balls down to Griff. For a start, you'll be monkey barring across the river using the older branches. Then you'll be gurgling the rudest song you know to Mushi and Ma with your mouth full of river water, Siddy said. And after that, there's the midnight dance to the tree spirits on top of hard time Bob's wagon. Mole grinned. Oh, and you've got to take a bath in the mud swamp beyond the glade, then roll in the clean washing. Alfie's eyes were wide. You two did all that to get into the tribe? Mole's eyes sparkled. Course. Then she slipped off her stool and buried her head in Griff's fur to hide her smirk. The camp celebrated all through the day and long into the night. And with Skull and Hemlock gone from the deep wood, no one thought to keep watch. But set back from the clearing, tucked into the knotted branches of a yew tree, a figure squatted. Two enormous leathery wings forked up out of its back, folded for now, like giant hands in a darkened prey. Jet black eyes shone through the mask of burnt wood, following every move that the girl and the wildcat made down below. The eyes blinked once, and then like some huge insect the figure crawled higher up the tree, right through the canopy, until it was looking out over the forest. 
It waited for several minutes and then it took off into the velvety darkness, shredding the night with each thrust of its wings. Down in the clearing, Mole glanced up and frowned. The stars glittered back at her, as they always did, a puzzle of shimmering lights. But somewhere, not so far away, inside a house lit only by candles, a snakeskin mask looked up. Its owner crossed the room to the window and looked out at the night, and then it smiled darkly as the leathery wings beat closer. Thank you to all of those children who have tuned in every single day to listen to this fantastic story. If you want to read more, there's lots of choices available out there. We just encourage you to read as much as possible. Let us know what you think. We'd be glad to hear your comments. Thank you very much.